Your Honor, I'm going to cover a few factual details um, without overly rehashing what has already been said. <clears throat> During the pendency of this investigation in this case, Mr. Wade and Ms. Willis basically lived Rod and Leach's lifestyle of the rich and famous. And they did this riding on the backs of the defendants in this case, funded by the taxpayers of Fulton County and the state of Georgia. With the money that was paid to Mr. Wade through the contract that Ms. Willis got him. That money flow, that is the personal interest that you asked about. She was personally benefiting from the position, from the job, from the scope of the investigation, from the scope of the indictment, and how they conducted it. Um, and we know this, we know from the records that have been submitted before the court that Mr. Wade paid at least $17,095 towards this relationship. Um, that does not even include the various dinners, the day trips that both Wade and Willis admitted to, so that number is likely even higher. We know from the documents that Ms. Willis only paid $1,394 for an airline ticket. Um, we know from Ms. Yurdy, who was pretty much uncontested, there was no evidence presented by the dis state disputing her time frame, that that relationship started in 2019. She saw them kissing, she saw them hugging. Now, whether or not they had sex before January of 2022, I do not know. Um, they admitted sometime in early 2022, and I found it curious that they both, Wade and Willis, just went straight to the sex. So maybe that's when they started having sex. I do not know. But the relationship predated that. And their combined and overly suggestive um, focus on that is a red herring to this court and to the defense that that's what they want you to focus on. They want you to ignore all the evidence that the relationship predated that. The relationship started in 2019. The relationship continued through 2020. The relationship continued through 2021. Um, looking at the cell phone communications, just in the first 11 months of 2021, over 2,000 calls, almost 9,800 texts. You know, I don't even think love-struck teenagers communicate that much. Um, the November 29th and November 30th, Escapade. Phone call from Miss Willis between Miss Willis and Mr. Wade, 1132 that night. Um, shortly after midnight, the phone starts traveling down from where Mr. Wade lives and ends up where Miss Willis is staying, and he's there until roughly 4:55 a.m. Um, none of the excuses, none of the explanations that Mr. Wade gave, go into the Porsche experience go into dinner, um, go into the airport, none of that explains that. I'm pretty sure the Porsche experience isn't open in the middle of the night. I'm pretty sure that there weren't any restaurants that he drove 30 to 45 minutes to go eat at in the middle of the night right after he talked to Miss Willis. Um, teenagers have a name for those kind of calls and those kind of escapades. I won't go into it. Um, but the documentary evidence, the objective evidence, undercuts everything that both Wade and Willis said. Um, when you look at Miss Yurdy, again, she unequivocally said that relationship began in 2019. She saw physical evidence of a romantic relationship. Mr. Bradley, in the text messages, which are substantive evidence, said that that relationship began in 2019. Again, his January, you know, temporary amnesia that somehow was triggered temporarily after Gabe Banks called him, we can question that. But we do have statements from him that specifically said that relationship predated Mr. Wade's appointment by Ms. Willis. Um, you asked, well, and Mr. Wade, you asked what the materiality would be. How much is enough? Well, clearly 17,000 is enough. Um, but Fulton County has told us, has told Mrs. Willis what the materiality is. It's $100 in a year. She twice signed declarations, certifications that she did not receive any gifts. 
And even under her strained, <clears throat> her strained explanation, um, there were monies, there were gifts, there were dinners, there were excess contributions flowing her way that exceeded $100. Um, her excuse, or I'm sorry, her explanation, well, I just paid it in cash. That just does not stand to reason. It does not hold up to the light of truth. Um, anyone that has ever been in a money laundering trial, a forfeiture trial, if that's the explanation we give the state, they laugh. Oh, I just gave cash. I have no records for it. I have no source for it. The only thing that she could say that was a source for the money, because at times she said she was down to $500 to $1,000. The only explanation she had is, well, sometimes I go to Publix and I may get an extra $50. That shows up on your debit card or your credit card. Did they bring those records in? No. Did they bring her bank accounts in? No. Did they bring any documentary, documentary evidence in? No, they did not. And why is that important, Judge? Yes, the burden is ours. But under OCGA 24-14-22, OCGA if a party has evidence in such party's power and within such party's reach uh, by which he or she may repel a claim, and they had that power, Ms. Willis had that power, Mr. Wade had that power, that they can repel the claim that we have made against them, but they admit to produce it, or if they produce weaker evidence, then you, as the fact finder judge, it is in your power to disregard that and a presumption arises that that documentary evidence that is in their possession that they failed to produce supports our claim. Um, and that is something that the state relies on regularly in criminal trials. And that is something that the court should rely on in this case when formulating um, its factual findings. And we know that both Mr. Wade and Ms. Willis have some difficulty expressing the truth when it comes to their relationship in these cases. We know Mr. Wade lied in his interrogatories multiple times. We know Ms. Willis falsely certified that she hadn't received any gifts from anybody. And Mr. Wade clearly was a prohibited source. He was someone doing business with Fulton County. Anything over $100 in a year, she had to put down. And she put zero. Um, and it defies imagination that she could somehow forget about all these trips, all these dinners, all these day trips, and not put that money down. Um, you had asked, I think it was Mr. Gillen, did she say in that church speech or anywhere else that the defendants were guilty? And I think she did in that church speech. She said in that church speech, and she was talking about a conversation that she apparently had with God, talking about herself. She said, this leader has a trial conviction rate of 95%. She said, the trial team this leader put together has a conviction rate of 95%. I do not see how anyone, and I think that was purposefully intended by Ms. Willis, I do not see how anyone can listen to those two statements and not take that Ms. Willis is telling everyone in that church and everyone that's going to hear that in the media afterwards, that these defendants are guilty. That is what she was saying. She is a prosecutor. She's familiar with the U.S. v. Berger. Every single, pro every single attorney that's ever been a prosecutor is familiar with the dictates, uh, dictates of that U.S. Supreme Court case. That is a foul blow. That is improper, and she violated pretty much every tenant a prosecutor must buy by to seek truth and justice in a particular case. So judge, when you're looking at this, the uncontroverted evidence shows that they had a relationship prior. The uncontroverted evidence shows that Mr. Wade lavishly spent on Ms. Willis. The uncontroverted evidence shows that the money that he was spending on Ms. Willis came from this contract that he had, and I'm not just talking about the contract as a special prosecutor, but there's also those other questionable contracts that no matter whom his partner seemed to be, they also got. Um, there is a direct financial benefit that Ms. Willis received from this. Um, and Judge, looking back at what Ms. 
uh, Judge McFerrin said, if merely hosting a fundraiser for a political opponent of a putative defendant creates not only the appearance but an actual conflict, and what Ms. Willis has done since then in this case creates an actual conflict. But again, as prior counsel has stated, we only need to show the appearance of a conflict. And we have done that by preponderance of the evidence. In fact, I believe we've shown an actual conflict. But nonetheless, the result should be that Ms. Willis and her office should be disqualified from this case. Uh, we still have a few more minutes. I think Mr. Cromo may have something to say. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Harry MacDougall for Mr. Clark. I'm going to talk further about conflicts, and I'm going to assume the most difficult standard for us to meet, which is actual conflict. <clears throat> but before I begin that, I want to add just a little bit to what has already been said about the standards that apply to prosecutors. Our appellate courts have said often the administration of the law, and especially that of the criminal law, should, like Caesar's wife, be above suspicion and should be free from all temptation, bias, or prejudice so far as it is possible for our courts to accomplish it. The first occurrence of that that I can find is Nichols v. State more than 100 years ago, 1915. The most recent, Regista v. State in the Supreme Court in 2010, although they don't refer to Caesar's wife. That requirement is also embedded in the prosecutor's statutory oath, 15-18-2, which requires impartially and without fear or favor discharge my duties as district attorney and take only my lawful compensation, so help me God. <clears throat> the general rule on conflicts of interest for lawyers is in Rule of Professional Conduct 1.7. And we all know, it's all drummed into us, that we cannot have a conflict of interest. And if we do, we have to withdraw or we will be disqualified. The basic idea is that a conflict of interest impairs the lawyer's independent professional judgment. That's the test of a conflict and whether it can be waived and whether it's disqualifying. And th that conflict is not just financial. It can be any conflict that impairs your independent professional judgment. And you see that in McLaughlin v. Payne. The court asked what was a personal interest for pers purposes of disqualification. <clears throat> it's anything that impairs professional judgment. That's reflected in the ABA <coughs> standards that were quoted uh, by Mr. Merchant, <clears throat> which list uh, the prosecutor's personal, political, financial, professional, business, property, or other interests or relationships, and that's really embedded in the prosecutor's oath to act impartially. And the earlier disqualification order by Judge McBurney was based on political interests, not financial. <clears throat> what my colleagues have described as forensic misconduct is also cognizable as a conflict of interest based on that footnote in Williams' case. The root of all of the problems that we see in this court right now is a conflict of interest arising from their individual personal interests in perpetuating and concealing their relationship. That's the original sin from which all of the other problems flow. There are six different actual conflicts of interest in this case any one of which warrants disqualification, but collectively, practically compelling. First, the financial conflict that's already been covered. <clears throat> Second, the personal ambition, political ambition. There, third, there's a dovetailed or complementary pattern <clears throat> of deceit and concealment of the relationship and the money. Fourth, the speech at the church. Fifth, the motion for protective order that the DA filed <clears throat> in Mr. Wade's divorce case. Sixth, the way the state has conducted the defense of this motion to disqualify, especially the hearing. <clears throat> On
on the financial piece, the court asked for a limiting principle and asked about materiality. The limiting principle is whatever impairs the independent professional judgment of the lawyer. That is applied routinely. <clears throat> we have a county code section that flatly prohibits gifts from contractors, period. We have, by analogy, the federal bribery statute, which has a threshold of $5,000, 18 U.S.C. 666. The court asked about burdens and inferences. The court can draw a negative inference from the state's failure to produce evidence to support the invisible magic cash balancing theory based on State v. Thomas, 311 Georgia 407, <clears throat> particularly footnote 19. As to the timing question that the court asked about, <clears throat> There were two contracts for Mr. Wade executed after they acknowledged the relationship began. Each one of them afflicted uh, or conflicted under county and common law. The second conflict is her political ambition for which he was previously chastised by Judge McBurney. And that's also present in this book. The inside flap of this book says that they were given, quote, exclusive access to thousands of secret documents, emails, text messages, and audio recordings. The court has twice denied defense motions to unseal special purpose grand jury materials. She helped herself to get the glory of this book. I introduced certified copies of a number of county code sections. I'm not going to walk through those, but I'll tell you why they matter. The stack of law from the state constitution down to the county ordinances imposes a regime on the DA under which she has three obligations. She has to go to the county commission to get approval to pay him like she did. She cannot accept gifts from a prohibited source. She has to disclose the gifts that she received. She evaded all of those requirements. Section 2-69 of the county code prohibits gifts from prohibited sources, which he was. There is no boyfriend exception. The disclosure forms, the evidence is sufficient for you to find that her disclosure form for 2022 is false and that it is a false writing. That's an actual conflict of interest between her duty legal duty of disclosure, her legal duty of candor as a prosecutor, and her private and personal interests in concealing the relationship, concealing the gifts, and keeping the gravy train rolling for as long as possible. His part in the pattern of concealment is a story you see in many divorce cases. The husband is hiding things from his wife. How much money he's making, the other woman, and what he's spending on the other woman. And he got on that stand, lied in his interrogatories, and he got on the stand and he lied about lying in the interrogatories. And the lawyers for the DA, the DA's office, they just sat there and let him do it. They did nothing to correct obviously perjured testimony. In and of itself, that warrants disqualification of every one of them. The reason they lied and covered it up was to avoid the trouble they're in right now. That served their personal interests to the detriment of their public duties as prosecutors. The speech at the church. I want to focus on why she did that. Mr. Gillen talked about that. She did it to deflect attention from her own misconduct and that of Mr. Wade. She violated her public duty as a prosecutor to serve her personal interests and the personal interests of her boyfriend. That is a disqualifying conflict between her personal interests and her public duty that is actual, operational, and materialized, and it rests on undisputed facts. The next thing that she did that was a disqualifying conflict of interest was the emergency motion for protective order that she filed in the divorce. I filed a certified copy of that as Exhibit 37. 
she sought a protective order under the Apex Doctrine on the grounds that she's the DA. And the whole filing is expressly predicated on her status as DA. In fact, she never lets you forget it. She says it 27 times in 12 pages. In that filing, speaking as DA, she said, the circumstances, quote, suggest that defendant Joycelyn Wade is using the legal process to harass and embarrass District Attorney Willis, and in doing so is obstructing and interfering with an ongoing criminal investigation. In the prayer for relief on page 11, she asked for six months to, quote, complete a review of the filings in the instant case, investigate and depose relevant witnesses with regard to the interference and obstruction this motion contends. There's no sugarcoating it. That's a clear violation of Rule of Professional Conduct 3.4H, which prohibits lawyers from making threats of criminal prosecution to gain advantage in a civil case. She abused her power, she abused her position to threaten her boyfriend's wife with criminal prosecution to gain advantage for herself and her boyfriend in her boyfriend's divorce. She violated her public duties not to make a, that kind of a threat in order to serve her private personal interests and those of Mr. Wade. Another actual operational conflict. The last category is the conduct of the defense of this hearing. <clears throat> there are a lot of objections made based on attorney-client privilege during Mr. Bradley's testimony. Most of those objections were made by the state. But the privilege being asserted does not belong to the state. It belongs to Mr. Wade. That shows that the DA's office is serving the personal interests of the DA and Mr. Wade in carrying out further concealment and cover-up of their relationship and not the cause of justice they are sworn to serve. That is a conflict of interest. It's a continuation of the wrongful pattern of concealment and cover-up that they've engaged in since the beginning. But now they've enlisted the entire office in the enterprise. In the written response to the motion to disqualify, they said this, and I quote, to be absolutely clear, there is no evidence that D.A. Willis derived any financial benefit from Mr. Wade. That's on page 15. Flat out false. Ten lawyers in this case put their name on that, starting with the D.A. So throw another log on the bonfire of conflicts of interest. The problem here is that the DA cannot distinguish between her personal interests and ambitions on the one hand and her public duties as a prosecutor on the other, and apparently neither can, neither can anyone else in their office. Of the six conflicts I've identified, only one is subject to a conflict in the evidence. This is a case study in what happens when you operate under a conflict of interest. It's put an irreparable stain on the case. Think of the message that would be sent if they were not disqualified. If this is tolerated, we'll get more of it. This office is a global laughing stock because of their conduct. They should be disqualified and the case should be dismissed. Your Honor, there's not much uh, oxygen left in the room. Um, we we, we uh, delineated the times based on the whole presentation. Is, would, would Your Honor consider some time for us in rebuttal? No. Okay. Well, then, can I reserve what I had five minutes for? Sure. Rebuttal? That's fine. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. 